and welcome to Real Clear Fetish Talks Real Clear Play, a podcast that kind of deals with sober life, kink life, and everything in between. Uh, this is the second episode of the sixth season. Uh, this time the format is slightly different yet again because now we are actually on Zoom and recording there. So it's still pre-recorded, but it's uh, my guest is in a different location to me and a completely different time zone as well. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Michael. Hi, Michael. Hi, how are you? I'm very well, and you? I'm doing great. <laughs> Well, welcome to this uh, pre-recorded podcast episode. Glad to be here. Well, as always, we'll talk. Uh, we'll start with four standard questions, and then we'll just see where the conversation goes. Perfect. Fantastic. What do you prefer? I call you names, pronouns, and title. Um, it depends on what realm we're in. In the business world, I'm Michael. In the kink world, I'm either the pig farmer or Orson the pig farmer. And my pronouns are he, him. Fantastic. Fantastic. Tell me a little bit about yourself. I am from Ohio in the United States of America. I am 32 years old. I, I grew up on a farm. Shocking, I know. And I raised pigs and... You know, I really, really enjoyed it. Pigs are some of the most intelligent creatures I've ever dealt with. Um, and then I grew out into a leather bar and decided, or well, really figured out that all pigs are intelligent. <laughs> well, I, I've met some unintelligent pigs in the past, but that that's another story. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, Completely clear-headed, sober, or social drinker? Uh, I do socially drink, um, never in excess and never more than one or two, but uh, social, yes. Uh, sexual, it's, you know, it's impossible to delve into the realm of, is this consensual? Because I'm drunk and they might be drunk, and that's kind of scary for me. Absolutely, yeah. It's it's it, this is a a, a con repeating theme in, in a lot of my guests. Like when we're talking about sex and consent, any chemical in the system, then you question you can question the consent. Absolutely. Um, and this last question: What is clear uh, play to you, and why is it important? Clear play to me is important. Well, first off, it's you mean you can't really have substance in sex because of consent, but also like you don't know whether you're actually into something if you're not clear headed. Like I might be like grinding my teeth while getting pounded out behind an oil drum on a beat dock somewhere and I'm into the person or the setting and maybe not the person and is that a good experience for me? I don't know because I, I'm not in my right mind. So being clear headed is just kind of the easiest way to know whether you're actually into the person, the place, the sexual activity, what's going on, everything. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so important that we have like clear lines and even especially when I became sober, I kind of had to do like one box of I did all these things was I into them and then there's this box where I did these things I'm definitely into those and then go from there and just learn from it yeah absolutely like um I've experienced so many different things and so many different states of <laughs> my mind that I've had to kind of step back and start back at square one vanilla like doing things and then slowly reintroducing kink um which has been a very fun experience because I'm doing it with people that I know I'm into and that I trust implicitly and that also kind of makes me a little bit more open than I would have been like I was I open when I was getting high and using drugs and alcohol to kind of feed that but 
I was, you know, like I said, I was kind of grinding my teeth and just doing it for the experience and not for the experience. Absolutely. Well, let, let's uh, backtrack a little bit. Um, so you grew up on a pig farm. Yeah. <laughs> that is that is really funny because we didn't have a pig farm, but we did have pigs and I took care of them. So, yeah, um, I would say, yes, they're very intelligent, but they're bloody destructive as well. If you let them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, all pigs are like that <laughs> <laughs> so you you grew up on a pig farm did your your um kink start around like worker gear then and like that kind of stuff i know absolutely. it did with me <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so like i just a man in a muddy pair of jeans and boots and like a <laughs> a dirty shirt is and very erotic and it's very sexy but I will go into that even further and any man in a working class uniform is hot as hell like I work in a factory <laughs> like there are some hotties in there and I will ooh, can't do it but I want to <laughs> so from uh, being uh, grew up on a pig farm and so when did you like start exploring kinks and when did the chems come in when did the drugs come in so I was actually I like studied dance and all that it, growing up a little bit off and on and then as an adult a very like 18 to 23 I was very into the dance scene like classical ballet some jazz I was doing color guard like I was really into that which kind of like shifted my focus away from the sex for a while um, but then when I got out of that, I moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, and walked into a leather bar, and the rest is history. I was obsessed with, first off, the smells, the looks of the men, like, oh my god, they were some of the most beautiful creatures and men and everything in between that I ever met were in Cincinnati. Um, and that's also how I got my name, The Pig Farmer. I was going into the bar regularly on Broadway. May it rest in peace. Um, it sadly closed a few years back, but I was in the bar and I had made a bunch of friends there and it was really becoming my home away from home. And we were just talking one day and then one of my favorite bartenders ever, Danny, walked in. And as per custom, I would walk up to him and just immediately go to town on his pit. And they said, oh, such a pig, such a pig. I was like, oh, funny that. I used to raise pigs. The rest is history. <laughs> um, but that's where I really started to experiment with kink. I had been very sexual on the farm growing up, but like it was all kind of hush-hush because I wasn't able to really experience. I wasn't allowed to be loud. Like, so, <laughs> so I really started to experiment. I was getting more into public play, which is my fave. But uh, then I was really starting to delve into bondage, kink, water sports, um, electro, like all of the things that you would expect to meet people who are into ball stomping, uh, spanking, and all that. I was starting to experience and then sort of around that time I went to a party with some asshole that I was dating and he was like here try this and he's like it's just like poppers don't worry about it and the red flags were going in my head but there were a lot of really hot boys at this party so I went along with it and turns out nothing out of a crack pipe is legal <laughs> yeah that that's not like poppers no yeah but I, you know I was into it I wasn't necessarily into it but then it just you know earwormed its way into my mind and it was all history and downhill from there so I was partying then and then I was also not being able to get as high as everybody else for some reason and I was smoking three times as much as them 
And then I eventually wound up with the needle in my arm and ruining my life and throwing away so many jobs and opportunities and and still experience the sex and kink and getting it all confused and what is sexual, what is the drug and getting it all muddled and then, yeah, and just trying to get back from that has been immensely and difficult and emotional and impossibly difficult journey, but I have to, like, I was so kinky and I loved kink and like the kink family is so tight knit, supportive and meant a lot to me, but I went beyond all that. So, yeah. I, I don't know. You make it, you make me a little bit emotional listening to you because, uh, I'm we talked about this before the episode and I asked your permission and 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 to talk about how we met. Yeah. Uh, and we met in 2017 at IML, mm-hmm. both of our not <laughs> in some random hotel room. That as far as I remember. And, and that's how we've connected. Absolutely. Uh, first, first time around, we kept contact after that. Then I started getting sober. You struggled definitely when we've talked to each other, and you know, I've even from a distance I've sent supportive words to you, and it's like you can do this type of stuff. So it's it's so mind blowing, but also it makes me so happy that we can do this and we can actually talk about it in yeah. past tense. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was I was this close to bringing up that moment walking into that hotel room but I wanted you to segue because you're in charge of this thing (laughs) (laughs) well I mean in charge of a lot of things um but it's 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 I I remember quite vividly hanging out with you because at one point we were outside the IML hotel and there was this random fucking guy following us around (laughs) <laughs> and we had to get we had to get a security guard to escort him away from us. <laughs> I've now started going unless we had a, a, a paranoia together. Right. <laughs> I, I I was just like, was that real or was that the drugs? I was not quite sure, but I'm sh- I'm sure we both remember this situation fairly yeah. okay. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, I'm just glad we didn't lean into it and just like, you know what? Come on. What's going on here? We'll figure this out. <laughs> Absolutely, and it, it was. It's, do you know what? Even even at my messiest, and you at your messiest with with each other, it it, it was not. We weren't. I don't think we were very. Uh, sometimes when you're you're high, you became you become very selfish and you become very driven on certain things. Really? You never came off like that at all when when I was with you at that time you were very gentle and you were like still took care of people even being messy and so was i it's it's so even with like meeting at a using stage in our recovery uh or pre uh, before recovery um you left an impact with me because you were such a gentle nice person and you don't meet them a lot when you go to these chill outs. No. Uh, I, I I remember distinctly like seeing you and like having this like I want to protect you and like just because we're you we're I feel like we're both very genuine and that mixing that drug and that is just a recipe for disaster because so many people will take advantage of you and us and anybody like because they're all using they're wanting to use your dick they're you're wanting to use your hoe they want you for they only want the things you can give them and they only want your drugs and all that and like people just take advantage and that is like one thing that I've never been able to do like I've never been able to take advantage of people and what I don't know why and probably the Catholic guilt that my grandmother beat into my head but <laughs> but like I've never been able to and I saw you and you just touched my heart in a way that 
many people don't. And I want I, I wanted to protect you and I wanted to be there with you. And I, I wanted I was ready to fly back to London with you. <laughs> but uh, that was a no passport kind of really put a damper in that. <laughs> oh, oh, you you that flight home was ridiculous because I went to the wrong airport missed my flight then i had to go to a connecting flight to atlanta made it just God. about and then i sat the whole flight coughing because i had well crystal meth lungs at that point oh, and the poor people next to me must have been, been driven insane with my <laughs> coughing but uh i i jokingly say this and i would never recommend this to anyone but it's a very effective way to get over jet lag because no. I did not have jet lag. <laughs> you're, you're, who cares, right? I mean, <laughs> well, uh, you, you, situations like that, you have to really look back and you kind of have to laugh and just be happy you got out of it in one piece. I mean, I was stuck in Chicago for, I think, two weeks after that because that hotel room we met in, um, I left my wallet in there so that I wouldn't lose it. And he didn't come back for like... 12 hours, and I think that's, we, we we went down and we had like a little, we went down to the fry and got some water and yeah. tried to eat something, but my wallet was there, so I couldn't get on my Greyhound back to Ohio, because you have to have an ID to get on a Greyhound in the United States, so um, I wasn't able to get bought, so I was there for a week, and then I was there for another week, and I was, I ended up in that host house, and it was disgusting and flooded, and I'm like, what am I doing? And you know what? Even that wasn't enough to get me away from that because I was still having some hot, kinky sex and great sex and air quotes on the great sex because yeah, was it great? I I don't feel like it was. It's it's I think especially when you're still in the using head, um, you kind of you you're very good at romanticizing things and and making it look more shiny. Anyone watching and listening to this, and we're jokingly talking about this things, it's horrendous. It's okay. it's 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 we also because of the trauma of it, we have to laugh. Absolutely. We put ourselves in ridiculous situations. For example, the guy in the hotel room, I just left my suitcase there. It's like, oh, you seem like a nice guy. I'll just leave all my stuff here. Yeah. Um <laughs> And and nowadays it was like I wouldn't dream of that. Jesus Christ! What if he never came back, or if he stole all my stuff, okay. stuff like that? It's 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 mind boggling. But thinking about all like air quotes, the horny sex and the trauma, and and you talking about going to someone's flat, which is awful. When was I know a lot of people you like to use the word rock bottom. But did you have a rock bottom? Is there anything that's like definitively now I need to fucking make a change? I've had rock bottom after rock bottom after rock bottom. I, you know, I like, it's almost like my family will joke, like, how further can you go? Like, and we joke now that, I you know what? I can do better. I can, I can go further if you need me to. But um, really, like, I... So I was in jail for 15 days in 2018 um, for driving on a suspended license a year before that. And I didn't go to court and they were like, oh, maybe this is it. Maybe I'll do it. And then I got out and then immediately went to somebody's house, got more drugs. And that continued on until later that year when I was getting arrested for f felonies. And so like I went through that. I was sober for a while after that. And then uh, Miss Tina just came knocking back and she's like, you know what we can do, we can still use it. We can still have a job and hold a career. And like, she's just so, she's so manipulative and obviously like it's my mind. And so then I sober again and then high again and then sober again. And then and then I was getting kicked out of my house in Columbus because I moved to Columbus and my rock bottom would have been when I had nobody. I was homeless for three months last year 
and I was fighting tooth and nail just to eat and just to continue to use and all this. And then I couldn't do it. And then I walked over to this guy's house under the premise of a dom and sub relationship. He had found me the year before online and he saw a pig farmer as my profile name. And he's like, this is a guy I should get to know. And he was sober. So I was like, you know what? He's safe. So I continued chatting with him. And then I was at his house and I was high. And he's like, I, I can't have sex with you. Okay, cool. I understand that. Um, I need you to go with me to my ex's place. I have to get all of my gear because I go go dancing at this point. And I needed my go I needed my gear for my ex's house. So I was like, mm -hmm. will you ride with me? And he said yes. And I got over there and he wouldn't go with me, which is understandable. Uh, his warrant. Um, he wanted to do GHB with me. So he's like, can you get me some? I was like, sure, I can find some. Sober. Yeah. Um, he wanted to, okay, so I will. I'll have sex with you. Yeah, okay. And then he was like, let me tie you up. You're fidgety. Let me tie you up. I'm like, uh, okay. Um, now, one substance or intoxicant that I've never, not at least since getting sober, the, the when I was in jail, I got sober, obviously. After that, I could not handle poppers. Poppers can't do them. They make me nauseous. They give me a headache. They make me sick. Well, I'm tied up in this man's house, and I had told him on numerous occasions leading up that I, I know poppers. Like, well, he's trying to ram it in. He can't get it in because I'm tied up. I'm fidgety, and I'm really not wanting this to happen right now because I wanted to be, I wanted to experience this beautiful, beautiful man. And I wanted to feel it. I wanted to feel good, but I was literally only there to, for other reasons. and he talked me into it and he was trying to so he shoved poppers on my nose and I was asking him to stop and he was like keep going and he just kept going and he was fucking me and you know he was not stopping and I'm literally like crying trying to get him to stop and blah 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 and I eventually just started screaming stop 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 and he was like stop it my roommate's asleep I was like thank god for the roommate because otherwise he would have kept going all night and then he was like, what, what, what was going on? I was like, I was asking you to stop. He's like, well, you didn't say the safe word. We didn't establish a safe word before this. So stop is the safe word. No is the safe word. There are rules. And he claims to be the biggest dom around. No, you're just trying to use people and you're still a user. And he's still at it and he's still at large, but I'm at least... I know, and the people that he touches, and I, like, I go back and forth all the time, like, do I try and do something? And then karma, and I, you know, <laughs> it's just terrible, like, but he still doing it, and he obviously has people that are consensual and better subs than I am, but he's done this to multiple people, and I, I don't know, so that was really my rock bottom the rock bottom of, of rock bottom the -est rock bottoms <laughs> um but i like and then he was and they kicked me out like i like i'm homeless i kicked me out and made a meme is my fault you know that yeah because that's how that's how users are they, it's not their fault they're blameless they are perfect yeah I I want I want to say thank you for sharing that and I I can I can tell it's not the most comfortable story to tell um for anyone listening or watching that found this difficult to listen to I implore you to sit with that emotion because 
it happens more often than you think. Um, I have other horror stories I've been told down the line, and it it breaks my heart to hear this story from you because you don't deserve that. Um, but I'm so happy that you feel comfortable to talk about it because if someone listens to this and kind of goes, okay, he told me these things, red flags, red flags, red flags, it gives other people tools to look out for. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to thank you for that. Of course, that's why I'm here, to help and to touch other people and make sure that I am giving people the opportunity to learn from what I've been through and to hopefully not have to experience the same things that I have. Um, I've, I'm at the point in my recovery where being, I, I am the, I'm the only person that I can control. So I know that on this day, I'm not going to do these things. And, but now I'm at the point where I need to help other people recognize and behavior reroute and all those <laughs> terms that I've learned about in my six spouts of rehab. Um, and they need to, that's what I need to do. That's how, that's how I need to and continue with my recoveries to help other people so yeah how how did you find like you mentioned rehab how did you find that as um a gay person um trying to come off crystal meth where it is connected to sex how how because i've heard stories from other addicts it can be quite tough because there won't be a lot of people that might have the same issues as you yeah um so I, my first spout of rehab was good. I got a counselor who I really connected with and I kept him for five years. He was my counselor and I continued to meet with him. I continued to talk with him. I was in and out of rehab with him as part of my center central uh, care team. And he was great but like sometimes i would be in group settings and that wasn't exactly the best because sometimes there would be females or super uh straight laced um men and they don't identify or they don't care or they don't want to know about my experience because they feel it's disgusting so I would really sit back and kind of listen more, a lot more at the beginning. And then as we got further into it and as my like experiences with rehab and getting out of rehab and using, and I was able to kind of really pick and choose what sort of, what sort of um, like tools that I was learning in rehab were useful towards me that I was able to kind of cut down on the kink portions and really the sex portions and talk about my experiences in ways that were kind of acceptable, which is kind of, that's actually really fucking terrible and makes it really hard in order for me to connect with other people in these straight focused rehabs. But it's, I mean, I had to, like I had to participate because if you're not going to participate in your own recovery, then you're not going to recover. No, you have to be active and you have to. So I had to really curtail everything I was doing and saying and how I was acting. And then I have really kind of just built my central circle to be people that I can talk about these kinds of things with. And I've taken my experiences in rehab and kind of tailored them to be able to talk about these things that I need to talk about with people that I care and love about or care and love. And they have the same cares and love for me. So I am able to talk about those things with them and they might not realize that I'm rehabbing with them, but that's kind of what I'm doing when I talk about these experiences. 
because I have to, I have to talk about them. It's the only way to get them off of my chest. And like, I, I will sometimes will lay awake at night and remember getting high in a park and like getting my ass blown out by five guys on a park bench. And I have to unromanticize it and remember that they were not attractive and they were kind of disgusting. And like, I, I have to take apart everything that I have experienced and rewire it into what it actually was. So I can still have those experiences where like, yeah, that was kind of hot, but it was only kind of hot. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's when you get to like, when you start having a clear head and you kind of have to look at the baggage afterwards and kind of figure out what am I into? What was definitely not me and more the drugs that was doing it. So you're, you're in rehab. Um, can I ask how long you've been uh, clear of drugs now? Um, I have been clear of drugs since November. I had been sober for a while before that. And then I was, in a situation where I was kicked out of my house. I lost my job. This was all at the same time that I found out I was a, that I was HIV positive. And so I was positive and I was trying to figure out what that meant for me. Now, for that, I had been unable to be on PrEP um, because I was on treatment for hepatitis C because I was an IV, IV drug user. So I ended up with hepatitis C and I lived with that for years, but then I was finally in treatment and then I was unable to take PrEP and then I was free and clear of hepatitis C. And then all of a sudden I'm deathly ill, throwing up everything. I'm unable to eat. And then I was like, I can't do it anymore. So I went to the hospital and I found out I was HIV positive. And I was like, you know what? I didn't even, I took it in stride. I immediately, they're telling me that I'm HIV positive. I'm immediately going through Scruff Grinder, all of those and updating my profiles to HIV positive. Uh, so I found out and then I was living with a boyfriend at the time and then like it just was not working. So then I found myself to be homeless. And then at the same time, I lost my job because I had taken so much time off of work because I was in the hospital. And <laughs> then I was homeless. And you know what? That I mean, they just found my way back into the life. And that is also the same time that I found out that the person that was a dom was not a dom and so then i was like okay i can't do this anymore and then one of my oldest and best friends moved to columbus and he has been my savior he let me move in with him and his husband and i'm now in school so i'm really turning my life around again it's been a little bit more recent but this is still the longest i've gone sober and i do plan on keeping that and i'm trying to do it right this time around and yeah <laughs> It's 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 a lot of, a lot of people when they become sober is like oh it's that's the end all you've done blah, blah, blah. but a lot of people don't realize that no it it's not it's not about perfection it's it's about yes did you screw up in November absolutely was the fuck it button very big absolutely you 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 got thrown a couple of curveballs I would say um it's 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 of it's it's such a hard one because I would never say that that I would just like never condone using, but I would also say, well, sometimes life's just shit and yeah. it happens. And it's more a question about, yes, you had a stumble, but what do you do afterwards? Right. And that's the more important thing. And it sounds to me that you are doing all the right things to make sure that now you're on a path of success yeah. uh, back in school good people around you um 
yeah, that's the most important bit. It's not so much what's behind you. It's more what's in now. Mm -hmm. But uh, yet again, thank you for sharing that because that is not easy to share either. No, it's not. Um, Back in school, I have the people around me that I need to have around me. Um, And I want to have around me. I've got a great friend group. Um, I'm going camping a lot. Um, thanks for the tan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't tan, as you can tell. <laughs> well, it's all right. Um, it really shows the spank marks on your ass when. <laughs> I'm normally the one giving the spankings. Thank you very much. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and the tools are all there. I'll take my punishment now. (laughs) I'll be right over. I'm booking a flight as we speak. Perfect. See you in what? 12 hours? Approximately. Yeah, 12 hours. So (laughs) what is is the school? What is the dream? Yeah, so I'm in school at um, a coding boot camp. It's a six-month program to learn the basics of web development um, and to get a job back in um tech which is actually the what i was doing before i met my dear dear friend miss tina um i was in uh banking on a team that uh was working with uh different departments and getting them updated collections systems so i was kind of the frontline person as a subject matter expert and blah 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 and jargon 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 um and it just happened to find my way back into that uh by meeting a very dear dear friend of mine who has really been my rock for the last nine months and he's he's really great but he's helping me um with school and all that um so the goal is to get a job in the tech field and never look back and continue on with school and become a project manager, which was what I wanted to be before all of this happened. So it's weird how that kind of circled back and reintroduced itself into my life when I really needed it to. And now, um, of course, you're still a kinkster. You still love kink. You're still the pig farmer. Yes. How are you finding doing the kinky stuff the fetish, the levers, and stuff like that without the chemicals in the system? It's different. It's definitely different, um, if not a little bit more difficult. I'm a very, very shy farm kid. I know the people who see me don't necessarily see that because I've built this persona. The pig farmer persona is not my first inclinations my first i'm very shy i'm very reserved i'm not necessarily the most outgoing but i want to be so i built up this persona to help with that and i've really delved i've really curtailed that situation um and over the past several years i've been able to with the pig farmer i've been able to uh, disassociate those so i've used the pig farmer in order to be a little bit more vocal and expressing the desires that i have with my sexual partners um but the people that i am also sexually active with um don't necessarily see that all the time so i'm sure it can be confusing um but so i'm just really starting from square one i've started a little bit with the light bondage and i really want to get back into the more intense bondage play um i've got a flogger i've got a very 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 nice belt like it's a nice black um you know what i'm talking about it's just Cough lever that will not necessarily hurt, but gives the sound that it hurts. And that's quite popular here in Columbus. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah, so I've 
really just been slowly meandering back in there with the mindset that if I go too far, I could end up back where I started and that's not where I want to be. So I'm really very careful about who I introduce sex and kink with because I'm terrified. It's it's terrifying. Like if some I could walk into another situation and be forced or tied up into doing something just because they're not who they say they are. So I'm really limiting who I'm having sex with. And that's not, that's different for me. <laughs> Different but healthy. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. This is, this, is, this is the one of one of the things we learn when we become sober is the word boundaries. <laughs> Who fucking knew that we had boundaries and there were certain things that we don't actually want to do? Yeah, yeah. And we can actually say no. <laughs> yeah, and the, so the no, the no, saying no is really what is difficult for me because I have it in ground into me that I have. To please people, who knew? A gay man who wants to please people. But like the no word is difficult for me to actually say because I was, my home life was not necessarily the greatest growing up. Was it terrible? No. But there are a lot of traumas that I have yet to unpack from my childhood, like being forced to be the person who cleaned up after everybody. And I was forced to literally my entire family would make me do shit. And I wouldn't say, I wouldn't complain. Would I do it immediately? No, but then they would get mad and then I would get start to panic. So it's been ingrained in me for so long that no is a, just a word that I, it should be my daily, like, I'm going to tell you no today that sort of thing like my daily affirmations of no there we are um so it's been an experience and I have been very good about not getting myself into situations where I cannot foresee the end and I'm not a fortune teller but that was the one trick that I learned that I became very good at in rehab was is this going to lead me in a situation where I could potentially say yes I would love to do drugs with you um and I got quite good at that for a while um until last year but I really started focusing on at least predicting the next two steps where can this go and do I want to go there it's 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 also very good when you have a good safety net with good people around you and and if Potentially, I definitely have been in situations at parties where I've seen early recovery. I got triggered by standing in the queue for the toilets oh. because that would be where I would go and snort something. Yeah. And it completely blindsided me. But I had a friend there. I could just kind of go, do you know what? I'm not I'm struggling a little bit here. Yeah. I need to get this out of my head by saying it to you and then I'll feel better. And I did. Yeah. And it's it, it that's the thing with addiction is if you sit on it, it builds and it builds and it builds and builds until you hit the fuck it button. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so like I I I was very reckless early in recovery and and probably like not everybody could recover the way I mean everybody's recovery is different, but the way I did it would probably have everybody clutching their pearls and <laughs> like but I would literally throw my sisters myself into situations until I got until I got the fear exposure the what what's the actual term the uh trigger exposure like I would I would do it with people that I could have the situation and I, I wouldn't necessarily tell them that I was going through it but I would relay like oh last time I was here I was smoking crack in the bathroom yeah. yeah um and that would be how I would verbalize that I like so I would because I don't want anybody to worry because that would be the worst right but yeah. I would you know what? the way you told that it's like oh you would just like a throwaway comment saying yeah. oh I, I used to smoke crack here or <laughs> do you know I do that all the fucking time and 
especially for I, I refer to people who don't use drugs, I have never used drugs. I refer to them as muggles. They don't really know the fucking trauma about it. Um, and you could just see the horror on their face. It was <laughs> like, geez. I was like, no, 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 it's fine. It's just right. my head that I wanted to stick a needle in my arm. But right. that's fine. I've now said it to you. Yeah. I'm making myself accountable. Yeah. I scared the shit out of you, but that doesn't matter. You listened. <laughs> right. I don't know. Yeah. And then, you know, that's, that is very entertaining. And I've really, uh, in my work environment that I'm currently in as the factory, the very blue collar, like working guy, like they, <laughs> some of the things that I say is just like, kind of like, just to see, I love pushing those boundaries and seeing their responses and shock value and, it's very entertaining to me because at the end of the day, like, I don't want to be in that environment. So that's my coping mechanism and they love it. So I'm glad that they love it because I'm not getting my ass kicked behind the water cooler, but, <laughs> but so, uh, on your, on your Instagram, the pig farmer, um, 1609, is it? Yeah. 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 Uh, what's the 1609 for, by the way? No, I graduated high school in 2009 and 16 was my soccer number. <laughs> um, okay okay so that was a little story behind it but uh it, it shows you as uh well you have a like a separate profession as a go-go dancer yeah do you still do that i do and i just did it as recently as two weeks ago um i really got into that again because i had stripped a little bit back before all of this happened but um I got into it last year um, as like just a little reason to go to the bars really mm. without having, yeah. So like I, I I do drink a little bit, but I don't drink in excess, but I, I like to dance because then I can dance and just let loose and really just feel the music because music has always been such a powerful part of my life. But I love to dance and but I don't necessarily want to dance with anybody so it was just kind of the natural progression so I do go go dance a lot I mainly travel outside of Columbus to like Pittsburgh uh Cleveland Cincinnati Dayton um and I will go go dance around and it's just a fun excuse to get out to the bar without so that I have to clip a clear head because my fucking trashed on the box i could literally break my foot break somebody else uh yeah but it, it's it's a fun thing to do and um quite good at it <laughs> well you did mention earlier that you used to study dance so yeah. I, I would assume so right um so it's it's a lot of people are now watching and listening i kind of goes up but did he not say he was shy but there is a very big difference performing on a stage than actually interacting with people. Yeah, I just, yeah. if anyone looked at my Instagram, I just did my first solo with my chorus last season yes. in full levers. I did I, the rap, rap verse in Vogue. <laughs> yes. Um, and a lot of people was like, well, Ralph, you say you're an introvert and you're really shy and slightly insecure. And, and in most cases I am, I am, I'm, take me out of my levers I'm very uncomfortable right. um but that was you kind of get to a point where if you go on stage you kind of go like fuck it yeah you just go for it mm -hmm. and then so like we all have like our armor so like if I were like I wore I was in New York City this past weekend for like a quick vacation and like any you can dress any way you want in New York City and nobody's going to give you a, much about it and I was walking down uh, in Times Square in a kilt my leather vest uh, my uh, leather and kink shirt and I, I I loved it because people were looking at me but not really like looking until some guy was screaming faggots at me and my friend who I was walking down the street with but that was it that if you're not getting caught oh, don't don't we all love a drive by faggot? Yeah. Um, it was like yeah and yeah yeah. I literally was like yeah. What's your problem with that? 
And then I grabbed my friend's ass and kissed him and we kept going. But I mean, so like, it, it's a set of this, you're in an uncomfortable setting. So I'm immediately going to default into well, my armor. So I'm going to put on my leather vest or a kilt. I love a kilt. Uh, kilts are my favorite. And my leather kilt is my absolute favorite, but I couldn't bring it because of, you know, the packing. I only took a cherry on. I, I have a beautiful northbound um, leather mm -hmm. kilt. And it's like six, seven kilos. So yeah. taking that in, in hold luggage, forget it. Right, right. Um, yeah, so I threw that on and I felt the most confident. I mean, that I, as I ever feel, but like, that's my armor. So like, I'm that's my Superman cape. So just to like, we're not going to completely stop right yet, just yet. But I'm just curious, what is your favorite piece of gear? Hmm. besides the kilts of course you've just mentioned but uh, what i do have my very very nice leather kilt that is was in fact uh i had custom made to match a leather formal that i used to have until it was stolen from my car hmm. I locked the door my fault but um that is my probably my favorite but is not the most i don't wear it that often special occasions um, my vest, though, is probably my favorite because, like, I've never had the greatest body. Um, and the body that y'all see on my Instagram is not the body that I see when I look in the mirror, obviously. But I feel so comfortable in my vest because, ew, so everybody's like, why don't you wear harnesses? And I do. I have a harness or two, but they literally just drive all the focus on the part of my body that I need to work that I feel I should work on more but don't because <laughs> but so my vest I've had I bought it to wear to claw the Cleveland other area weekend in the it was the year of COVID so I bought that and I was like I'm gonna wear this I'm gonna feel so comfortable in this because it's you know it's it's going to be perfect and then of course COVID and I didn't really get to debut that much until after that and by that I'd had it for two years and so I I wear it regularly and if anything I if anything happened to that vest I would probably be very upset and go out and buy a new one but I, it's just like that vest meant so much to me because it was the first leather that I owned that made me feel so confident and made me feel so sexy. It, it's it's gear has such a power. I, I've definitely had people comment on me when I put my full levers on. It's like my body posture changes, my attitude changes. And then if I'm just in normal work clothes and kind of just meld into the background, that's that's yeah. that's when I'm a wallflower and I'm I'm okay with being a wallflower and that will never change but it's like the fact that I can stomp out on the stage in full levers to doing Vogue of all songs it's just like it's such a contrast to someone to to who I am in in private like mm -hmm. you mentioned that you you you're quite shy and then you do go-go work but it's such a different experience and wearing stuff that in, like boosts our confidence clothes is like I always get a little bit like when I'm talking to someone online it's like oh I want to be naked it's like yeah that's not when I'm confident <laughs> right the clothes and the leather helped me compartmentalize my life into where I could really close off the fear and to put that in a box and put it over here and that's not necessarily I don't know if that's necessarily the best way to deal with those types of things, but that's what worked for me. And I kind of had to like start opening the box a little bit, but I can be naked in public. And I mean, I've, I've shot a porn, I've shot a porn scene and I was scared as, I was scared as hell and I was nervous as hell. And you know, at the first hour of the shoot, I wasn't even hard and uh, like and 
like the editors like had a field day. Uh, <laughs> How long is this ago? This was last March at Texas Bear Roundup. And side note for anybody who like the bear community, I've really become quite attached to just because they don't, I mean, they have just as much body issues as anybody else, but like they've really kind of taken me under their paws and uh, uh, kind of helped me really be more confident and comfortable in my own skin because they look at me and you know what they're not necessarily 1000 percent attracted to me they don't have i don't have a dateable body but they they look at me and they're like you're hot you're hot don't, don't I, 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 I will agree with them i will yeah. agree with them yeah. um we we are coming to the end of the episode already i know shock oh uh, where where did the hour go um <laughs> here at the end if anyone's watched or listened and you've said something that's either touched them or they made them laugh and so on where can they get a hold of you okay so i do have um uh, my socials uh i have a performer profile orson pig orson the pig farmer or is it no it's just orson pig farmer on facebook my Twitter is pigfarmer1609, um, and my Instagram is thepigfarmer1609. And if you find my Muggle profile, you will sadly find that I'm nearing my friend limit. So you can <laughs> shoot me a message. I will see it. <laughs> Well, I can only say thank you for coming on and being so frank and so honest and just completely just being yeah, open about what you've been through. And I can only absolutely thank you for that. And it's like you almost made me fucking cry. I'm not going to make you pay for that. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm just so happy. And of course, um, I mentioned this in the last episode as well. If anyone's listened to this and... This episode has been tough. There's been some tough subjects. If you've been triggered, if you have become upset or anything by anything that's been said, reach out to any in your local community. Reach out to Michael Orson or to me. Uh, I'm. We are all here to help each other. And that's the main thing because addictions is such a kick in the ass. It is the hardest battle you will ever fight and you have to fight it every day but it the amount of effort you have to put into that fight does shift the further away from you get but you still have to fight because you never know when something's going to happen and you're just going to not have fought for long enough or not hard if you've not fought at all for a while then you're going to be right back in addiction's arms and then you have to start over and yeah reach out <laughs> absolutely thank you very much for coming on of course. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And that was this week's episode. It was absolutely lovely to have Michael slash Orson on to chat about his journey in recovery kink and go-go dancing and so on. It was absolutely a joy to listen to. I was so happy to have him on and actually see him flourish um, because he has a big soft spot in my heart. Absolutely. I'll be back again next week with the following episode. So stay sober, stay kinky, and bye.